¿Cómo están? Bienvenidos otra vez. Estamos a 24 horas para el lanzamiento de otro lander que va a la Luna. Esta vez la misión IM-2 o Intuitive Machines 2 que va a estar lanzando en un Falcon 9 y llevando al lander que se llama Atina al, muy cerca del polo sur de la Luna. La idea es aterrizar el 6 de marzo, alunizar el 6 de marzo. Este lander va cargado de instrumentos. Es la segunda vez que Intuitive Machines va a intentar, este, va, va a llegar a la superficie de la Luna. Y hoy tuvimos en el, la oportunidad en el sitio de prensa de la NASA, acá en el Centro Espacial Kennedy, de tener entrevistas uno a uno con gente involucrada en la misión. Así que eh, eh, me pude sentar a charlar un ratito con el CEO de, y el cofundador, nada más ni nada menos, Stephen Altemus, que tiene una trayectoria muy larga en la NASA, muchos años en la NASA, y después abrió, cofundó esta empresa y está liderando esta empresa que hoy por hoy es uno de los líderes en, 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 infraestructura, en proveer infraestructura, logística y comunicaciones de toda esta nueva economía lunar que se está comenzando a gestar. Eh, así que quise hablar con él, no solamente para hablar sobre la misión IM-2, sino además cómo él ve el futuro, cómo ve esta economía lunar, qué servicios va a empezar a prestar Intuitive Machines, desde comunicaciones, logística, el vehículo terreno lunar para astronautas también, que tiene contrato con la NASA. ¿Y cómo ve la situación actual? ¿no? Con una nueva administración, estamos en un periodo de transición que parece un poco caótico, eh, con gente diciendo, no, no vamos al alumno, vamos a Marte mejor, o, o, lo, o los dos. Así que bueno, quise saber su opinión con respecto a varios temas. Estamos en una oficina, para que ustedes tengan una idea, eso es el sitio de prensa de la NASA acá, y, y esta no es su oficina, eh, el, la, la, las oficinas de Intuitive Machine están en Houston, y tampoco es la mía, eh, pero muy gentilmente el equipo de comunicaciones de la NASA siempre nos prestan las oficinas donde ellos mismos trabajan para que montemos ahí este, una especie de mini estudio, entonces podemos elegir a ver en qué oficina podemos, así que bueno, nos para que sepan que eh, este, armamos esta entrevista ahí en una oficina prestada, así que, que muy, muy amable toda la, siempre la gente de la NASA que nos presta sus oficinas. Así que bueno, espero que disfruten la charla con Steven. Um, I just wanted to start because I, I, I've been uh, listening to several of your uh, interviews uh, for the last couple of years. Congratulations not only for getting us back to the moon after more than 50 years, uh, but also because you are like uh, doubling down with this IM2 mission loaded with experiments. So it's, it's exciting. Very exciting. The goal is to, you know, amp it up every mission to build greater and greater capability and do it on a regular cadence so that we're always flying, always learning, always expanding the envelope of what can be done, what is the art of the possible. This idea of intuitive machines being an, can I say it, an enabler? Uh, I, I heard you say that we want to provide logistics, communications, navigations, allowing companies to do their thing mining or uh, 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 helping the, to grow the lunar economy. So this position of, of an, an, ela an enabler, uh, it, was every it was from the very, er very early stages of the company or you were like transforming the objectives of the company all along? Well, I always had the idea of creating a blueprint to form an economy around the moon. What, how do you architect an economy around the moon? And you're going to need things like delivery services, logistics supply, data transmission and navigation, and to be able to operate infrastructure or systems autonomously. And so the key is how do you begin building that? You build it piece by piece. The first step was we had to demonstrate that we could fly to the moon and land softly at a commercial price point that was so competitive that it, that it woke everybody up. You know, it was two orders of magnitude cheaper than what had historically been done. You know, I participated uh, last month in the Spacecom conference in Orlando, and I think it's the first time that I um, hear exactly what you said. We are pa entire panels about logistics, transportation. Now that we know we're getting there, uh, we need to start organizing ourselves to see how, how do we do it? Which companies? How to provide uh, um, in orbit uh, refueling, cis uh, lunar transportation. So we are getting there, right? Finally. We're finally getting there, right? The, 
there, a lot of people didn't believe when, when we were heads down working for four years to build the lunar program to deliver the first lander, right? Fixed price for a hundred million dollars um, in the time it takes to get an undergraduate degree, an engineering degree. Um, we did it. We did it. And there were a lot of people who didn't believe. But when you do it, now it opens people's eyes and imagination about what could be next. And along the way, we built a ground network to communicate with to right. from the moon. And from that first mission, that ground communication network had to be laid in place. That was the first idea of now you move from delivery into communications, data transmission, and navigation. And so as we did that under the first mission, we helped NASA with a procurement to provide data relay services and navigation around the moon. And then we were awarded that contract. And we uh, also showed that the ground network to communicate to that data relay network, we were awarded that. And so we could use our commercial networks now to build this highway of data back and forth to the moon. So you were like contacting different ground stations around the world to allow you to communicate with different spaceships on the moon, right? Mm -hmm. But then now you have a contract with NASA to, to build this satellite constellation around the moon, providing high speed communications for different, not only for NASA, but for also for commercial companies, right? That's right. For uh, near, near space network? How is near it? space network is mm -hmm. to communicate around the moon, navigate around the moon, provide the lunar GPS, if you will, and bring the data back to Earth in a ground network and provide it to international partners, commercial companies, other government agencies, NASA, all of that now can use this commercial version of the near space network, which is a variant of the deep space network that NASA manages. No, and I hear you say, I think something that I agree 100% is that uh, uh, the fact of having like this kind of a broadband or ability to communicate will allow us to have images maybe in 4K of astronauts on the moon inspiring new generations, which is basically we are living in like an visual society. So we need we need to show what we're doing, right? Exactly. Everybody's grown up with CGI and grown up with these movies, these science fiction movies that are just spectacular visually, right? So we're not going to get our grandfather's black and white imagery from the moon. That's not <laughs> acceptable anymore. No. <laughs> we have to do something better than that. It's intuitive machines uh, building uh, their own satellites for this constellation, or you need an, a, a third-party vendor? Uh, it's a combination. We, we get some things from a supply chain and some things we do in-house to, to field this whole system. Okay. Yeah. I um, One of the things you mentioned recently is that in, in 2024, we had like this... Um, agreement, bipartisan agreement with space and the budget and, uh, and, and how the commercial companies are changing the landscape n with NASA understanding the importance of commercial companies. Uh, and what about now? Uh, we are in the middle of a transition from administration to administration and, uh, and there's a lot of speculation. Of, no, let's go to Mars. No, let's keep the moon. Uh, I mean, are you worried? Can we, can we have a lunar economy without Artemis? Well, a couple questions there. <laughs> the, the one I would say is um, the lunar uh, economy is here to stay. Right. You know, we have never gone out into space and then retracted back away from that. We've always pushed the envelope as a, as a human species and we've made economies out of it. Low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, and now the next layer is the moon. It's this lunar moon, yeah. And we would never seed all the investment that was made from Apollo, you know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, to get out to the moon. We would never seed that to anyone else in the world. We're just going to build on it. And I think it's okay to set a stretch goal for the United States and the world to say, not only the moon, the next level of economy, but Mars. And over here, Mars is our stretch goal. And we ought to be striving to move further and further out in the solar system. So it's not moon or Mars. Correct. It's the moon and Mars. And Mars. And it's factories on the moon. And it's humans on Mars. So when you think about Artemis and can it survive, there's an importance to putting the infrastructure, the utilities, the transportation leg to the moon so that we can communicate to and from the moon, work up on the moon with autonomous systems, harvest the moon, 
look for geological features and, and rare earth materials and rare uh, minerals and, and get access to those. That doesn't necessarily need to be done with humans. So anything we do on the moon will be a stepping stone to Mars in the future. So it's just a logical uh, path and I'm not uh, worried at all because what this particular administration is going to do is pour energy and dollars into those things that are success. So when we land on the moon here on March 6th, that's a success. And then when we deploy our extreme hopper, that's a success. And we're going to keep doing that as a commercial company because the commercial economy innovates and that's our competitive edge in the United States. Right, perfect. So there's no, there's no way back. We, Not in my mind. Okay. Um, how is LTV? Because I know the uh, Intuitive Machine also has a contract with NASA to, con to build this lunar terrain vehicle. So, uh, uh, so you, you are producing a lot of stuff, not only landers, but communications and then infrastructure for the moon. How, is, it's a, how, how, do you, how are you going with the construction or maybe first steps of, of, uh, with the LTV? Yeah, so the lunar train vehicle is an incredible vehicle because it has to operate for 10 years on the moon and it has to work autonomously. Right. And with astronauts. So it's a very complex. You can leave it there. Leave it there and then just... Uh, drive it around and operate it autonomously through the network um, and you know do all the path planning and, and ob observations of how it moves um, that's fantastic then when the crew gets there you can drive it around and they can they can use it as a tool um, we're focused on two things one is how do you build the LTV what does it look like and we're in the middle of the design right now but how do you deliver it so what is the heavy cargo variant of our Nova lander look like how do you deliver what amounts to a, an F-150 Ford pickup truck to the surface of the moon, right? Right, right, you right. need a bigger, heavier cargo lander. So it's not only the lander design, it's the, I'm sorry, the, the rover design, it's the lander design. And how do you deliver it safely to the surface? And we're working on all of that right now. Um, now, we think that'll continue this year, um, and then there'll be another selection of, you know, who will actually get to do the demonstration mission. And we have our eyes set on doing that demonstration mission. Thank you, Stephen, for your time. Have you, after so many years at NASA, and you've been involved in so many programs, have you ever considered it crossed your mind to be an astronaut? <laughs> it did. Back in the day? It did. Back in the day. I think I'm over the hill at this point. Well, these days you never know. You can go with uh, any capsule, basically. But uh, <laughs> yeah, you so, you, so you had the idea? Yeah, back in uh, when I was working here at the uh, Shuttle Test Director launching uh -huh. space shuttles, I had the opportunity um, to, to apply to the astronaut corps and I was encouraged to do that and I, I didn't do it and I went to run engineering at Johnson Space Center instead. And I'm glad I did because here I am now in history, right. you know, wow. finding things on the moon and it's, it's, it's almost, it's a different version of being an astronaut. Thank you for your time and congratulations and good luck with the mission uh, with lunch tomorrow. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Gracias, Steven. La verdad, me encantó sentar 10 minutos con él nada más, pero no sé, es como que me da un poco más de tranquilidad el hecho de saber que no volvemos para atrás. O sea, eh, el hecho de ir a la luna es ya para quedarnos. Y creo que es el sentir general, ¿no? Eh, no importa eh, qué administración eh, llegue ayer, hoy o mañana, la idea es, creo que lo que está diciendo es muy, muy concreto, es siempre cada vez que se avanzó en algo no, no, se, no hay pasos para atrás, sino que al contrario, se, se construye en base a lo que haya, haya logrado y creo que ya el hecho de tener tres empresas yendo de manera privada a aterrizar en la Luna y muchas de ellas por segunda vez, creo que habla a las claras que no hay un camino de retorno. Así que me, me, me da mucha tranquilidad saber que es la Luna y Marte. Y creo que eso está muy bueno. Así que bueno, espero que les haya gustado la entrevista. Comentarios, por favor, por supuesto. Este, y ojalá te puedas, si, si recién llegás, suscríbete al canal Exploración Espacial, sumate a la familia. Bienvenido, eh, bienvenida. Y ojalá, este, vamos a estar mañana cubriendo el lanzamiento. Así que estoy pensando a ver todo la, el contenido que puedo generar para después pues, contarles más en detalle este lanzamiento de IM-2 Intuitive Machines, que además va a llevar un satélite, eh, no solamente de la empresa argentina Epic Aerospace, va a llevar un OTV eh, que va a, dejar una, va a ir a una órbita geoestacionaria, así que un, un paso importante para Epic Aerospace. Además va a haber otro satélite de la NASA, Trailblazer, que va a estar mapeando toda la superficie de la Luna para detectar hielo en la superficie y poder entender mejor 
cuál es la cantidad y en dónde está el hielo para futuras misiones satélites. Así que hay muchas cosas para contar y espero poder mañana hacer una cobertura mucho más completa. Así que bueno, nos vemos. Chau, chau.